you could you could go and write an option and sell the long off, or you can go and buy an option and you know buy the long and hold it and and get leverage. And you can obviously compose puts and calls and get into more advanced strategies. And so some of that's going to be interesting when we're doing like straddles and strangles and butterflies and condors. We're going to be releasing some interesting strategies over time for people to execute very simply. Um, where they can take more advanced market perspectives than, than you can with spot. And, and we think that'll be interesting and novel for uh, crypto users on, on these tokens that they've never been able to do it on before. GM, GM, everyone. My name is Degachi, the host of Scraping Bits. And today I'm with a special guest, Al. How, how's it doing, man? Great. Uh, here in sunny Florida, building Valorum. Oh, man. Well, the alligators. We love it. <laughs> Um, I think we should do a quick intro of who you are and, and what you do just to give some context. Sure. Uh, so I'm Al. I'm the CEO, head of technology at Valorum, and we're building uh, a new paradigm of decentralized options uh, to launch on Arbitrum uh, soon. Um, and how did you kind of get into all this stuff? Um, so why did you choose an options platform, you know, optimism, all that stuff? Yeah. So how it came about, you know, I have a background adjacent to finance. I was an infrastructure engineer at Bloomberg and at DE Shaw and never directly attached to the finance stuff, but always curious about it. And in 2020, when DeFi really started going, of course, was nerding out in DeFi and using it and looking at it and yeah. eventually quit my day job to go do MEV uh, searching and also to to kind of become a smart contract consultant, right? When, when about was and, it? When you got into MEV? And- yeah, this would have been like you know, spring of 2021, okay. uh, right when Flashbots was, was coming around. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was like a very interesting time for Prime MEV, time. right? Because, it, well, it changed from being like, oh, let's be in the mempool to like this off mempool uh, kind of sealed auction to, to get the top of block. And it was all about top of block and it was all about uh, gas efficiency if you were doing any of the, you know, fat head yeah strategies which were things at that time so if you go dig around in my github history you'll see i open source like my mev bot that would do this graph based uh, arbitrage search between yeah, so uniswap you know, and sushi swap yeah I mean, how long did you you spend on mev so i was doing that pretty much nights and weekends you know from maybe february of 21 into the summertime around june right. it's still like work in the day, work in the day job right so it was it was a, it was a hobby horse but it was very fun oh yeah yeah how did you manage to juggle it um like i guess nowadays in, in june I, I quit the day job and i was looking for something that could be a bit more of a consistent business and got into smart contract consultancy both independently and through raid guild uh which was my first exposure like working in a dow Right. Oh, right, yeah. And definitely very interesting. Yeah. Form of working. <laughs> different been, different yeah. than what you do at, at companies. Yeah, yeah. It would have been completely like 180. So I guess what was the kind of uh the onboarding process um getting into Web3? Yeah. Um I mean it, it was cool with Raid Guild, you know. I, I found it. I ended up in the Discord and uh talked to some people and and came in on a on a cohort. Um it didn't immediately work with it because I was busy with like the day job and the MEV. But later yeah. I was like, hey, guys, I'm thinking about, you know, going full time Web3. What do you have? And and just started like doing all these cool, different, small projects. Um, that mm-hmm. are, you know, it's mainly a shop that does like proof of concept builds and early, early builds for, you know, founders and people who are looking yeah. to build a new project. So got to do like a bunch of different stuff, which is a cool way to come into the space. It, w- it was definitely a good way to get exposure to a lot of stuff. Yeah. And did you like already have connections there? I guess, how did you meet everyone and start to like build this brand? Because I imagine you just didn't have a brand at all from scratch, right? Or did you already have like a Twitter established? Yeah, I mean, so actually, it's interesting you ask about that, like my personal brand for, you know, Alcibiades, I had considered like more towards that sort of summer of 2021, like what that might be as a smart contract consultant and put together, you know, like a landing page with like the services Mm -hmm. I offered and all that kind of stuff. Um, And did actually a consult with a a brand consultant uh, company is called Cult Method. And he helped me kind of develop the brand for it, which was which is super good. Uh, Can recommend he's a good guy. Uh, but yeah, and so you built the brand brand from scratch. And then I guess, how did you even get your name out there to begin with? 
For sure. Go, going to conferences, you know, talking to people in various discords, probably in like 30 or 40 different discords, uh, talking a lot in Flashbots, right? Made a lot of connections in the Flashbots discord. But I mean, that's the cool thing about Web3, right? Like you come in, you find something interesting, you join the discord, you contribute. And if your contributions are good, you know, you become a member of the community, which I, I, I thought was like a cool and novel thing that mm -hmm. there's very little gatekeeping, right? Yeah. I remember when I started, I was always people always told you to get involved in a community and that's where you grow the most and find the most opportunities. And I was like always confused of how to really like get ingrained within a community. So I guess what, what did you do to um, basically do that? I mean, particularly with Flashbots, I, I just started writing code and like talking about it and talking about the research, right? It was how I got into MEB. Mm -hmm. And then with, with Raid Guild, it was like, let's go build some smart contracts and, and went and built a, a bunch of smart contracts. I'm a builder. So the way that I yeah. get into communities is, is by building. Uh, yeah. So you, did you just open source stuff or was it mostly just asking questions? So it was asking questions. I open sourced a lot of the stuff, particularly around MEV after uh, yep, the fact, because yep, obviously there was some, some <laughs> alpha there. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's um, pretty hard to get into MEV, especially now with all the teams and the high competition. Um, but yeah. imagine back yeah, in the I day, mean, what, what was it kind of like? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't the same thing, right? And so that's one of the reasons I made the transition to smart contract consultancy instead of MEV, because it's very much, like you said, a super competitive uh, red queen theory type thing. And around the summer of 21 was when you started to see like serious teams who were doing it yeah. full time. And as like a, a solo you know, doing it as a hobby thing, yeah. uh, it became <laughs> something that was like, well, you know, diminishing returns at some point, uh, unless you, you want to go form a team. And whereas, you know, kind of my belief in building things is that mm -hmm. when you're creating net new things, you're playing a uh, positive sum game and yeah. MEV is a negative sum game, right? It's very interesting. It's very fun, but ultimately the profits will diminish over time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as it's basically like once you build this whole system and you're not winning, more often than not, then you don't really get anything out of it that's net positive for the ecosystem. And unless well, I guess you aside from it. what you learn and the, fr the friends you make along the way, right? Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. But still, like doing MEV, I guess it's not as friendly as you know being a smart contract developer because everybody's hiding the the I guess alpha or don't want to help with questions, misdirect you when they when they can. So it's, it's kind of like a yeah. PVP type arena. <laughs> it, it, it is, but you know, that, that can, that can be fun. And in fact, is, some of yeah. the closest relationships that like partnerships for my business right now came out of my time in MEV, right? Like our market oh, really? maker, Dark Forest Research, yeah, is somebody that I met in the Flashbots Discord, you know, back in that time. So like there's, there's some long-term partnerships that came from that time for me. Uh, so oh, I wow. definitely look back upon it pretty, pretty fondly. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I guess there is always the exception of friendly games. And I guess, did you team up at all? Or was it mostly just like chatting with other searchers? It was It was mostly chatting with other searchers. Um, and mm -hmm. then there was, you know, a chance to team up, but I teamed up at Raid Guild instead with other Raiders okay. and, uh, <laughs> and went and built product there. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess how did you kind of like transition into where you are now? So how long were you at Raid Guild for doing just consultancy as well? And then... Sure. Getting to where you yeah, are now. So from summer of 21, probably until, you know, spring of 22, I was doing more or less uh, smart contract consultancy at Raid Guild. Um, one of the big game changers for me in my Web3 journey uh, was working with, you know, one of my other persons who's involved in Valorum now. We discovered a civil attack going on on the ENS airdrop, and we oh. prevented that. And uh, in preventing that got like a pretty significant bounty, which we weren't, we weren't looking for. Like we did it as a purely white hat thing and told the, the NS team about it. Yeah. And then they're like, here are some tokens, um, <laughs> which is what kind of gave me the capital I needed to start thinking about a business that wasn't, you know, a service, but a business. Um, yep. And so one thing I had seen in the MEV stuff towards the kind of end of my involvement there and then looking at it from the outside was mm -hmm. that a lot of the, let's say like a double leg strategy, a two leg strategy of sushi swap, uniswap arbitrage started to get squeezed out by statistical arbitrage. So somebody would come and sit on one leg or the other and wait for the arb to emerge and then come back. And they were doing this with quite a bit of capital. And mm -hmm. so I started thinking about on these long tokens, how a searcher that didn't have that much capital might be able to do statistical arbitrage and remain like hedged using options. 
and that there was a need for options on long tail tokens, right? Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't being served. And so that's why I started thinking about Valorum kind of beginning of 2022 and ideating it. I think that's like in my journal, maybe the first time I talk about this idea of like, a you know, permissionless, no price Oracle yeah. uh, option system. Yeah. And, and just for the people that don't know, what is statistical arbitrage? I mean, it's, it's looking like if I sit on one side of a position, you know, what's, what's the likelihood that I'm going to make or lose money. And then you can kind of hedge that, right. That's how I would describe it. Um, mm -hmm. simply. So instead of like atomic arbitrage and MEV, where you go to one side and you come back in the same block and you've taken your profit, yep. you're now, uh, taking a chance over time, which is an evergreen strategy. If you're yeah. good at calculating it, it's not something that can be completely squeezed out. Whereas atomic arbitrage eventually is a race to the bottom and you can squeeze out every single, you know, way of profit basically. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like people holding these, uh, these shit coins, just waiting, waiting for someone to interact with it. Um, yep. and then going from there. And that's how you got the idea of these, you know, permissionless options. Um, so people can actually yeah. kind of like leverage this if they had no capital. Uh, cause that was kind of like the yeah, no, or, no or low capital. Yeah, yeah. Cause the person who I saw doing it, I think it was like, uh, zero X 56 or zero X 57, that big wallet, um, that people were always talking about at that time. And they had like, you know, $150 million of capital or something. And so it's like, as a searcher with maybe say $50,000 of capital, how can you run these same sorts of strategies as like a solo searcher? Um, and, and then I was also looking at the success of things like Ribbon at that time and, and some of the things I thought maybe weren't that great about things like Ribbon at that time and like how it could be done better um, and open mm -hmm. and these other systems. And so it's an interesting design space because like you look at what played out in, you know, equity markets in the 80s and 90s where yep. derivatives became, you know, way bigger than spot. And in, in crypto, you know, there's Deribit which is big, but it's still way mm -hmm. smaller than spot. And then on chain derivatives is like a tiny fraction of what spot trading is on chain. And yeah. I don't believe it's going to stay that way. And I think there's a giant unserved market waiting for something good to come along there. So it was like the biggest unserved opportunity I saw in DeFi when I started building this. Mm -hmm. And I guess, how did you approach building it in the first place? Uh, like what was kind of the process from okay, I have this idea to, you know, building this first open beta. Yeah. Um, so I was at, this is like the ETH Denver hackathon and started talking to people in, in February 22 about this idea and kind of secured a little bit of grant money and mm -hmm. some early uh, funding, you know, maybe um, not that much, but enough to go build a marketing website and, you know, kind yeah. of fund a, uh, a simple front end getting built and, Went, went and built a first cut of this in the summertime and okay. then started building uh, an API for it to be traded on. And then, you know, got more serious with it and went full time with it in the fall. Mm -hmm. So you needed like capital to basically start this or you were just kind of yeah, like... I mean, like a, a, a little bit, you know, yeah, to, to like, I do back end, right? But like to bring, bring a front end dev and write a React app and, and that sort of the things that I couldn't do. But yeah, needed to raise capital. Um, it was kind of inauspicious timing to raise because like right when I started thinking about raising capital was right when the whole Terra Luna implosion happened and oh, I had yeah. like term sheets <laughs> from people who were going to invest and they're like, I can't now. Um, like, no. so kind of had to bootstrap it. Right. <laughs> I mean, think, thinking back, I had an offer right at ETH Denver for this idea. Like when I had a one pager on it, basically for a mm -hmm. million dollars in funding for 10% of it on a one pager. And I was like, no, that's a bad deal. It's a way bigger idea than that. I'm not going to take the money. Uh, and then I proceeded to go and like collect small angel tickets for the entire year uh, to raise the same amount. So in oh, wow. retrospect, probably should have said yes to that deal. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it was, you know, it was not the greatest time to be raising in crypto during the bear uh, yeah. with all these instabilities around FTX and Terra Luna and all these other things. Um, interestingly, yeah. if Valorum had existed at the time of Terra Luna, people could have hedged themselves against stablecoin DPEG because you can do stablecoin DPEG insurance with Valorum, right? You could do stable mm -hmm. to stable uh, puts. So that's another kind of use case why it would have been cool to have at that time. Yeah, it seems like a, a, a critical piece of infrastructure that, that is like vacant right now and you're kind of like taking the slot, right? Yep, I, uh, that's what we're trying to do. So let's, let's make <laughs> it happen here. But um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a lot to build though, right? Like basically building sure, yeah. um, the kind of difference in the thesis and what's been done before is most of the options things that have come along, they've been 
a vertically integrated system that has like an AMM and pricing models built into mm -hmm. the AMM and all these kind of very opinionated stances versus what we've tried to do with Valorum is like build a clearing system and then a trade mm -hmm. API that people who have opinions about pricing options can hook up to and then trade those options peer to peer with each other, um, which is which is a different take and I think a better take, but having those separation of concerns and like clean abstractions between those systems uh, definitely was a lot of work as like a small team to build yeah. out. Um, I could talk more on that, but yeah, it, it adds a little bit of time to market for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess, how did you kind of approach building it step by step? So what did you build first? And did you basically write out like the architecture and then start building or were you kind of building and writing the architecture at the same time? Yeah. How did you go about that? Like planning and then executing? Yeah. So, so clear, you know, a lot of the idea was done by the spring time of 2022, but the implementation uh, probably really took until well into October to have solid and be like getting ready to send to audit. And then, the, you know, we, we could talk about like the smart contract security effort that we, we went into, which I find interesting. But given that it's like the way it works, it's an ERC-1155 multi-token standard, basically, with this clearing system built on top of it. Um, and, and what is the clearing system, wave just for some background? Yeah, so... You know, imagine that there's a holder of option, there's a writer of option. Uh, they're counterparties to each other, but the clearing system acts as a counterparty for each of them. So like the holder of the option is a counterparty to the clear system. The writer of the option is a counterparty to the clear system. They both get a tokenized representation of, you know, in the case of the holder, the long position, and in the case of the writer, the short position. And then they're able to, you know, settle the movement of funds with the clear right. smart contract um, to disintermediate like counterparty risk that you would see say in like traditional over the counter uh, yep. derivatives trades. Right. So it acts as, as a, a clearing mechanism uh, is basically what it does. And those mm -hmm. positions are tokenized as ERC 1155. Now the, the upside of using ERC 1155 is that it's way more gas efficient to deploy novel option types, novel option chains. So, you know, instead mm -hmm. of 2 million gas to go deploy an ERC-20, you're talking about 150,000 gas to create a new option type, which matters if you're doing, okay. say, daily yeah. options, right? Um, uh, the downside of it is that, you know, none of the AMMs and other things out there work with the ERC-1155. Um, so there's, yeah. there is actually, like, how are we going to let people trade ERC-1155s, right? And actually... OpenSea kind of came to the rescue with Seaport when they when they put Seaport out there as a public good. Um, it was like, okay, we can use this to let people trade this. We just need to build a backend to go on top of it. So thank you, Op OpenSea. <laughs> I mean, so the answer to your question about architecture, right? Like, it didn't happen all up front. A lot of it happened up front, but then a lot of it, of course, as you start building something, you, you learn, right? You can't always mm -hmm. think of everything ahead of time. So, so building clear, a lot of that did happen up front. But building the trade product, we lucked out in getting this this big thing from OpenSea. Um, yeah. And then, you know, even making it all the way to audit with clear, there, there are some things we look at afterwards, like, you know, oh, we could have done that differently. So there'll definitely be future versions. Um, you do you do what you can in foresight, but as humans, we have limited foresight, right? And you learn yeah. things and things change. Um, so yeah. And then how did you go about basically securing this? Um, we mentioned, how would you call it, off recording, use uh, invariant testing? Yeah. So, you know, towards the October 2022 timeframe, when the clear system had really come together, we started to get our first like significant funding, able to bring on some employees that weren't, uh, you know, very part time or just kind of involved out of interest. And I was down at DevCon Bogota and I met my now head of product, uh, but also really, you know, awesome Solidity dev, uh, Neo Dallas. And we were like talking about EVM opcodes in this elevator in Bogota at 1 a.m., right? And <laughs> I was like, okay, this is a guy I want to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Serendipitous meeting. And so we, we stayed in touch after the conference. I, I brought him on and we, we basically, you know, used Foundry and went gut unit tests and invariant tests and mm -hmm. property tests fuzzing in place on this thing. Got up to, you know, 100% code coverage before we Excellent. sent it to audit, which is something I think a lot of products and projects don't, don't do, do a good enough job of so that when the auditors got this thing, they were able to focus all of their energy on, you know, economic attack vectors and game theoretical imperfections rather yep. than, you know, off by one errors, which is not where you want your audit dollars going. 
<laughs> yeah. You want the the whole landscape kind of game theory stuff. So that's where the, the critical things come out come about. Um I think the majority of the the easy ones can be done from invariant or just unit tests. Yeah. Uh I guess pair that up with some fuzzing and you're quite set for the for majority. But yeah, that that's what you kinda want to get normal I guess security researchers and auditors to come in is for the, the really uh hard stuff, the creative kind of attacks. Yeah. I mean, we, we discovered some interesting things, right? Like there was, and we've mitigated it mostly now, but like a probabilistic imperfection in our assignment of exercise because we were incrementing the settlement seed every time. And so you could game the exercise assignment. And we went down this a bit of a rabbit hole in developing uh, like a random forest iterative log runtime probability mass function generator to mitigate this, right? You want to talk about getting nerd sniped in an audit. And yeah. we're like two months into building this thing, which is really cool. <laughs> and something we, we'd love is we have more funding to do for like version two to make this thing absolutely perfect. But what we ended up going with mm -hmm. for the mitigation was like not incrementing the settlement seed and making path determinism for exercise. So it was deterministic, but could not be gamed. And basically mm -hmm. the only thing that you can do now is choose not to write at some times if you don't want to uh but like yeah definitely audits when they do go deep like that they do get into game theory there is a yeah. thing where you know you can go really deep on it if you want to uh even you know to the point of danger for actually getting it done um yeah yeah i wonder if it's even possible to hire like an in-house security auditor to just like keep on you know thinking about these game theory kind of exploits is that something you've wanted to explore or not necessary so basically, like whatever iterations you make, they can um, they can basically find or keep on working on the code base for as long as it's out, instead of just hiring like a team um, for like a couple of weeks. I mean, the way that we've we've aligned it right is Zelik, who is our auditor, is now also like a close partner, and so we'll be using them continually. And our kind of plan for that is like we release 1.0, and we're going to do minor point releases a lot, like Seaport does we'll have mm -hmm. smallish deltas on the minor point releases. And since Zelik already built out a threat model, we'll continue to use them as our primary auditor. We're all very security minded on the protocol team at Valorum, right. but yep. you do need somebody who's outside of the day to day, I think to, you know, kind of see the forest for the trees, if you will, and see it yeah. a different way. I'm not sure that an internal person can play that red team uh, long term. But I think a close yeah, yeah. partner, a close partner who you know, has looked at the code base already to, to shave down the costs of bringing in a brand mm -hmm. new auditor each time. Uh, that's kind of the way we're looking at it now, you know? Yeah. And I guess, how did you, what, what do you look for as a, as a protocol developer in an auditing kind of report team output? Yeah. I mean, I want to see, you know, like we did with our audit, I was very happy, a threat model, uh, any invariants they can identify, you know, really detailed, impact write-ups on any findings they have. Uh, but mm -hmm. like, if you go check the Valorum audit, you'll see that there's like a 30 plus page threat model that talks about every single user input and then like what those can impact and traces it all the way down through the internals. And so like that's, high that quality. lets us make an assessment that's high quality from an auditor, right? And I think you only can get that one with the right auditing firm, but two, when you have the pre-audit work done. And I do think that that yeah. pre-audit work, by the way, is an unserved market segment for a lot of projects who maybe don't have those security-minded folks on the team who, mm -hmm. would, who would really benefit from a pre-audit firm that wasn't the auditor uh, to go in and do that test coverage and that kind of, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, and how did you go about basically creating your invariance? Uh, what's the kind of process for, for doing that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, our, our core invariant is, you know, that the, the clear product must remain collateralized up to the maximum possible liability of clear. Mm -hmm. There's actually some interesting things there when we thought about that more, when I talk about how you can't architect uh, everything up front. Right now, right now, clear is fully collateralized, but it doesn't need to be fully collateralized. It only needs to be collateralized up to the maximum theoretical liability based on the outstanding options and claim mm -hmm. ticket positions for the longs and shorts. Uh, so there's some more work to do there that I don't want to quite go into yet because there's some some plans uh, that I'm not quite yeah. ready to share. But, you know, no it, 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 it's interesting when you reason about 
your invariants that it can actually unlock these sort of new design spaces. But that's that's the core one, you know, because we want to make sure that all mm-hmm. the counterparties can get out what they need. But there, you know, there are some others. If you go poke around in the code base and just kind of thinking like, well, do all the claims add up? Do all the options add up? You know, is the outstanding supply what we what we think is going to be? Basically, a lot of uh, you know totaling and summing that you can do with uh, Forge Foundry that you can't necessarily do on chain gas efficiently. So you can you can write up actors, right? And then you can have these yeah. actors do a bunch of different things and make sure that the property holds uh, without having to add the overhead of checking it every single time at runtime. Although mm-hmm. I will say I you know I did see a case made by some of the nascent guys recently that it makes sense to check your core invariant on every single uh, function call that moves funds. And, you mm-hmm. know, their thesis that that's why Uniswap V2 hasn't been hacked. And I think there's some validity there and and something to definitely think deeply about. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely think uh, invariance is kind of the core of testing um, because that's your business logic and there's no real way to know what's happening without them. Um, and I, I think that's where automation falls short as well. Uh, since invariants are so specific to each code base and uh, the business logic of each code base, then you can't really know what's to look for. Um, but since you know it, then that's like a, a massive advantage and it's what people should definitely look for. But just to switch over a bit, I guess the process of building the team and I, I guess juggling multiple hats, how, how did you manage to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically been people I've met you know, I hit the conference circuit pretty hard for, mm-hmm. you know, a year and a half, two years and met many, many interesting people. And some of them would have interest in the project and some of them wouldn't. And the ones who had interest in the project and who were skilled, I would, you know, try to get to join me on the journey. Um, and I <laughs> built out a pretty cool team uh, and it happened kind of organically. So, mm-hmm. you know, my my thing in, in bringing people in is like, come in, you know, try it out. If it works, stay. If it doesn't work, uh, you know, don't. And built out a team of five people, probably had, you know, like 10 people come in and out um, with varying levels of interest on the project. And yeah. Yeah, I think I think we've got an interesting shop at Valorum and I'm interested to see how that team grows over time. But uh, mm-hmm. we're all super passionate about building, you know, a future of decentralized derivatives and kind of solving the product market fit for DeFi options. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. I think uh, what was kind of like the most difficult thing of, I guess, hiring? Because uh, of course you can get along with people, but... I think incentivizing them and getting them aligned with the vision is quite hard. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's I think it's finding people who believe in your vision is is a big part of it, rather than right. trying to align people. So it's people who see right. the the value yeah. and then yeah, providing them with the right incentives uh, is the way that I've looked at it and the way that I've had some success with it. You know, the other thing I think that's important is is ways of working in keeping people yeah. engaged when you're like a globally distributed asynchronous team with you know, <laughs> yeah. we have people from the Ukraine to the Pacific who are working on the team. So there's like a nine hour time zone spread. And like, yeah. you know, what are what are the core hours where people are online and like talking to each other? And how do we talk to each other through up mediums? Um, mm-hmm. I think that's important to think about as well. How do you properly incentivize people as well? Uh, I guess, obviously, salaries and equity as well. But how do you kind of determine what's best and yeah, what they want. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound kind of uh, web two here, but you know, I, I think the, uh, the salary plus equity plus target bonus structure works really well for people. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, you need people who are missionaries and not mercenaries. Uh, I've done some stuff on contract basis with people building out different pieces that can work as long as the milestones are well-defined, but ultimately is going to, yeah. is going to cost the project more at the end of the day. So you need passionate people who are willing to show up for, you know, salary and equity, and then maybe bonus when uh, the thing starts making some money. And, Mm -hmm. and then just, and then just build it. Um, And that, you know, it's pretty simple. It's been, you know, it's been great, mainly because the people that I found have been great and have been easy to work with and, uh, and excited about the project, right? Like, and if somebody's Mm -hmm. not, well, then, you know, that's not going to work out. I mean, you yeah. really, you know, <laughs> building a startup in Web3, especially here in the bear, like you got to be a yeah. believer in the cars, Brutal. right? Like, yeah, yeah. And I guess how, how do you approach scaling as well? So obviously when you bring on more people, it's you're going to transition more into like a managing role, right? Um, yeah. Or maybe I mean, that's, that's the, I mean, it's interesting because, right, I found myself as recently as like two weeks ago between full-time and part-time people being like the manager for eight people and then trying to write code. And um, 
also dealing with like investor relations and business development stuff for, for, the, yeah. for the launch. Yeah, it gets a little cool rough. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. So there's a point where you have to start delegating, right? And so like my head of product mm -hmm. now has his direct reports. I have some direct reports, less direct reports. And we actually have a pretty cool plan for that where eventually like we end up with a mark head of marketing, head of product, head of tech, and then they have direct reports and teams underneath them and like two product teams, you know, mm -hmm. kind of one for clear and one for trade, uh, kind of separating out those teams that are one right now and, and making sure nobody has more than like five uh, direct reports so they can manage effectively and, and still be either a player coach or part of a strategic team as we grow to maybe 15 people. But one of the, mm -hmm. one of the cool things with DeFi is that there's not a linear relationship between the amount of employees and the valuation and ability of a, uh, of a project to provide value in the space, uh, because you're leveraging, it's extremely high leverage. You're leveraging the blockchain tech, you're leveraging cloud technologies. Uh, so like, you know, when we go to market, we're not going to have, or maybe we will have yeah. 2000 users, but like we're able to service, you know, 2000 concurrent users with our API, mm -hmm. no problem. And we could scale that way up from there with not that much yeah. work. So there's not like a, a linear relationship to let's say like total value locked or total revenue or uh, yeah, total yeah, operating sure. expense to, you know, the amount of employees that need to be mm -hmm. working on a project or the amount of contributors that need to be working on a project. Yeah. And now that you have open beta available, was is this kind of how do you kind of approach like the beta and I guess seeing what people like and dislike and then approaching what to change or maybe adjust? Um, so so we've done quite a bit of thinking about that, particularly uh, Neo Dallas, who's setting up product of Lorem, has done a lot of thinking about that. Right, we have metrics instrumented like throughout the trader app and throughout the trade API yeah. to capture positive and negative health metrics, right? And to track, mm -hmm. you know, funnels, conversion funnels, retention metrics, negative experiences, like when a trader can't make a trade because there's insufficient liquidity and try to yeah. optimize those positive and negative things to make sure mm -hmm. it scales and that we're retaining the users and that the users are happy. Um, but prior, mm -hmm. you know, prior to that, we've been doing a lot of like closed beta usability testing. Uh, with people. Yeah. So we brought in people to close beta. It's like, hey, use this thing. What do you think? Let's get your feedback. So like our future users have been part of the design process of the user interface. And for the API, mm -hmm. even like we talked to our market makers, we've talked to possible takers as users of the API and try to optimize the API for their use cases too. So we're, we're user first project, right? We think about what the users yep. need, what the users want, what's going to be best for the users. And we ask them not directly, but indirectly and do these sort of experiments to, uh, to get the best result for them. And we're going to keep running that process and refining it uh, as time goes on. Yeah. And I guess, when did you first do your first kind of beta slash preview kind of thing? Because I think some people will build out their tool for, you know, months on end, but never do a preview. And they want once they finally get MVP and release it, nobody wants to use it. So what is the approach you kind of took? And do you think you would change anything? Sure. Yeah, I mean, over the course of the year, I was like Valorum's beta, Valorum's beta, Valorum's beta a couple times uh, over the yeah. course of the past year. And I might not have done that as much. I might have been more like, well, let's just take a select group of people in a closed beta and and have them right. work closely and get a little bit of their time and you know maybe even offer them a little bit of uh, incentive to, to be like long-term closed beta testers. Um, what yep. we did do right sort of in the past six months that I liked is, you know, we got people from both DeFi who are possible traders and also, by the way, people from uh, traditional equity derivatives trading in different capacities to come and usability test with us and kind of bridge that gap. Because the, the thing we're trying to solve with Valorum is why haven't DeFi options found fit? Why have traditional yep. finance options found fit. And so we've actually gotten a lot of those people from traditional finance options involved in bringing a kind of non crypto native perspective. Interesting. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, so it's like multiple views and thinking kind of long term, uh, yep. when a lot of, I guess, like next bull market, a lot of non crypto natives are going to come in. Well, yeah. And, and I mean, I think even now, like, you know, you look at, at options in equities, you can only trade them 35 hours a week, right? Yeah, uh, it's you crazy. Look at options in crypto, you're going to be able to trade them 24 hours a day. Yeah. Um, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to see where it goes. But yeah. Yeah, and I guess it targets all demographics as well. Like it's not just kind of, 
you know, one specific audience. Anybody can use it um, anytime, anywhere, really. So it's not just like one specific kind of user base. So it's it's quite like broad and who can use it. And they can use it whenever with whoever. So I think maybe walk through the process of, of how, uh, let's say I wanted to do an option with you. Um, how would that go? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a couple ways that you can use what we built, right? One is the user of Valorum Clear. And the user of Valorum Clear is maybe a centralized exchange, maybe a decentralized exchange who integrates with Valorum Clear and lets those Valorum Clear options uh, be traded. Maybe it's a DeFi options vault who leverages them yep. in some you know interesting way. Uh, maybe it's a Yearn strategist, something like that, right? There's the integrator who integrates mm -hmm. directly with Valorum Clear. Then for Valorum Trade, there's there's kind of three different classes of user that can come in and use it or three different types. There's like an automated taker. So that's somebody who's going to be writing an automated system that's going to make trades yep. through the API. There's an automated maker uh, that could be either on-chain or off-chain, which is something we've done differently, right? So like a maker can either be an AMM soon, not quite yet, or can be an off-chain yep. market maker that prices options and they can hook up to this API. And then the third person is what we call a web taker. So that's somebody who's coming in from the Valorum trade user interface okay. and making trades with the maker. So if you're you know, a taker and you want to open up, you know, let's say like a long put or a long call, you're going to be going into the trade UI and buying that from a market maker, selling it to a market maker. But it's all peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Um, so it'd be you corresponding with a maker or makers and getting the execution you want and then optionally taking the quote. Now you could be a writer too, right? Through the, through the mm -hmm. UI, you could, you could go and write an option and sell the long off, or you can go and buy an option and, you know, buy the long and hold it and, and get leverage. And you can obviously compose puts and calls and get into more advanced strategies. And so some of that's going to be interesting when we're doing like straddles and strangles and butterflies and condors, we're going to be releasing some interesting strategies over time for people to execute very simply. Um, where they can take more advanced mm -hmm. market perspectives than, than you can with spot. And, and we think that'll be interesting and novel for uh, crypto users on, on these tokens that they've never been able to do it on before. What, what's kind of like a, an example of a, one of these novel strategies that maybe you're not going to implement or maybe you are going to implement just like an example to give kind of some context, context of some more advanced strategies? Yeah, I mean, so if you go look at, there's this Dune dashboard, right, that shows the APYs yep. for Uniswap LPs. And a lot of Uniswap LPs lose money, but like a lot of the new tokens, long tail tokens, they have extremely high APY, uh, but people are losing money because of impermanent loss. So one of the strategies we're very interested in releasing is like, you know, straddle so that you can hedge your Uniswap LP position and, you know, yeah, pay out okay. some of that APY that you're getting from Uniswap, but then open up a straddle using Valorum trade and be hedged from your impermanent loss, like th these kind of things. And we'll be writing up like guides on how to do these sorts of things, but also all the traditional mm -hmm. option strategies that you'll see if you like, you know, go to the OCC education website and look at option strategies to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of take more advanced things where you're making money on volatility or you're losing money on volatility rather than just like, you know, yeah, I, bu I buy token and if token goes up, I make money. It's like, well, now you can make money <laughs> if token goes down or token goes up or you can make money if token doesn't go down or up or you can, you know, choose one of those. So, so what we call it is, you know, select your market sentiment and then you can choose one yeah. of these strategies that matches your market sentiment. Whether you think you're long vol, short vol, you know, bullish, bearish, whether you just want to accumulate an asset over time, whether you want to earn income mm -hmm. on an asset you already hold. There are a number of different option strategies that you can take for each of those that we're going to be packaging and providing in an easy to approach way uh, for people. Yeah, it sounds super interesting. And I think it's going to be very interesting for the DJ and sort of <laughs> contrary views of each other. Someone wants to, they think the market's going to go down. And the other one thinks it's going to go up. It's just going to be like mayhem. I wonder, it'll be interesting uh, when, like, I guess the market goes down and everybody's just trying to, like, short it, basically. And then there's no other, like, side. I, I guess there will be, like, another side. But if it's just, like, super obvious and everyone's, like, super bearish, then I, I assume there wouldn't be as much activity. Or maybe I, I'm a bit wrong. Well, I mean... You know, I think it works kind of like this, right? Market makers are going to take trades... Um, as long as they have the capital available to do so. And they're going to charge mm -hmm. a spread 
and hedge accordingly so that they can keep doing so. So there'll be there'll be somebody that's unopinionated and neutral on the other side that's just looking to capture a spread. And of course, like if there's a huge market movement, it may be that, you know, the makers uh, become short on capital. But I think as there's the traders that are coming in, more makers are going to come to the table. And again, this is something we thought about differently. Like there's potentially going to be, I hope, you know, 10, 15 different market makers eventually market making these options. Yeah, so yeah. We're going to have different perspectives and different pricing models. And, you know, hopefully it'll sure. remain pretty pretty liquid even in uh different market events but no way to tell until you know we see how it plays out in reality it's very yeah, hard yeah. to model all of that uh but we <laughs> architecturally we've approached in the most flexible way possible i'm going to shift the, the conversation to basically how do you kind of like structure your day You're juggling like a team managing managing the team and also doing like technical stuff as well it's quite a lot happening sure and I mean, I would add to that that I'm a family man, right? Like oh, yeah. I'm married with three kids. So <laughs> oh, yeah. there, there's that going on too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, how it's been looking uh, lately is pretty cool. So I, I wake up at 7 a.m. I don't set an alarm. Actually, the sprinklers that start in the backyard wake me up, uh, which oh, is wow. a pretty peaceful way to wake up to the sound of running water. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I like read all my emails, read all my chat messages, kind of catch up with anything. Because again, we're like this global team, right? So stuff is happening while I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people coming on in Europe before I'm awake. And so I catch up on all that. I review the calls for the day. And around like 9am after I've had my coffee, and maybe I've taken a walk or, or gone to the gym, I'll either ride my bike or drive my car to the office, which is like three miles from my house and, you know, sort of sort of sync up with the people who are, you know, in Europe who are devs, mm -hmm. uh, who are on earlier and, and then you know, kind of try to knock all my meetings out by about uh, 1 p.m. Because I'm I'm trying to follow the whole like maker time, manager time yeah. split right now that Paul Graham talks about where I do all my meetings and talking and all that in the morning. And then we have our stand up at noon where we kind of review everything we're doing or on Monday and Friday, we have our like planning and what we call our Friday wins mm -hmm. uh, where we like plan the week and then review what we did well. And then we kind of do a retro on Monday. We don't really get into any negatives on Friday. We want to go into the weekend with good vibes. But like in the in the afternoon, you know, I'll do coding. Sometimes I'll go late into the night. I, uh, you know, my best flow states really though on code happen between like 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Sometimes. Uh, yeah, same. I'll, I'll just, I'll, <laughs> yeah. Like the worst, so, worst yeah. hours. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like there's some different energy when everybody's asleep, like including, you know, the family or, and mm -hmm. everybody else who's working. And it's just like the quiet time. Uh, for deep work that goes on late at night. Uh, you know, that's, I mean, as a programmer, that's always been my thing. Yeah. Uh, but now I try, I try to shift that a little earlier so I can be on in the morning for, for manager time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess like, what's the, what's your like go-to strategy for getting into flow state and then managing that kind of time? Yeah. Um, Apple focus modes, dude. I, I mute all notifications. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, when, yeah, yeah, I mute all notifications. I turn off everything when I'm ready to go do code. And I open up my ID and I have a coffee or sometimes uh, maybe even a little bit of like chewing tobacco if I really need to get like uh, super focused. <laughs> and and then I'll uh, I'll just go in. You know, the, the thing about deep work for me as a developer is it takes me like a half hour to really get in context yeah. and then I can go. Yeah. And, um, I can go for like 12 hours. So it's also about knowing when to shut off the flow state uh, mm -hmm. so you don't end up staying up all night, but yeah. Yeah. And how do you kind of like manage distractions? Cause obviously there's Twitter and I guess if you're on discord or any kind of thing like Slack, do you just shut them off and just hope you don't touch them? <laughs> no, no, I, I shut them off, shut them off. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have like a, I have a coding focus, uh, state, right? And the, and the Apple thing that mutes everything except for like emergency calls from family members. So when I really want to code, that's, that's what I'll do. Uh, and then I have like a work state that will only allow stuff through from discord. And then I have like, you know, so I have a couple of different states, a personal state that will turn off discord and only let like messages from friends. So I leverage that pretty heavily. Uh, mm -hmm. because, because again, I'm working, you know, asynchronously. So there's not too many like in person tap on the shoulder interruptions. So I use notification yeah. manager uh, to control that. But it's hard. I mean, you know, we live in a in a, in a world where um, attention is very fragmented. And mm -hmm. it's very easy to be disrupted. Oh, yeah. And, you know, focus time is scarce, I would say. Oh, yeah. Um, in our lives, at least for me, it is. Oh, yeah, for me, for me as well. It's the reason I asked like that, that question of how do you deal with like discord and Twitter is because I personally have like a horrible time dealing with it even if 
I've got like my IDE on full screen. I still have like the tendency just to just like swipe left and oh, there there it all is. <laughs> Even if I close it on the sidebar, it'll just be like be there. So maybe like a strategy is just to get rid of it in the sidebar or have a. I've even heard someone have a, have a friend that's they have a whole different computer for it. It's not even like installed on their main computer, so it's taking it to the extreme. Um, I mean, it, it it helps because you know the way that products have been built, good products like Discord. Yeah, they're engineered to build habits, right? That's mm -hmm. where their power is derived from. The problem is sometimes they're too good at building habits, and then it becomes an addiction. Right? Yeah, and yeah. So, yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's the problem. But w when we think about like building product these days, we think about the core habit loop, right? How frequently does mm -hmm. a user come, and and how do you keep their attention, and do you want them to come use it daily or hourly, or you know yeah. these sorts of things. And things like Twitter and Discord have been super optimized to be very habit forming. Um, yeah, <laughs> and and I don't know if that's a force for good or a force for evil. Honestly, at the end of the day. Uh, this ha this sort of habit forming product building, but it's certainly profitable for the companies that have done it well, and it's certainly tooling that enables us to have like novel novel forms of association and communication. So, it's a uh, it's a powerful powerful tool, but maybe hard yeah. to manage in life. I mean, that's Super. yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, man. Yeah, I think the only real way is just to kind of delete them and not have them in, in pure sight, or at least yeah, at least have them not in visible view. You have to kind of do some effort to get to it. Um, yeah, I mean, going cold turkey is usually the great best way I, I've done it, but man. Well, have, have you brutal. tried the, seriously, man, Apple's built out some powerful tools for this. Like not only the muting the notifications, but the time limits. Like, so for all my socials, I time limit myself on my phone to two hours a day for oh, total. And that's not Discord, even, Twitter, everything. Yeah. Not even on the phone though, like on the laptop, like I have Discord there. Cause that's how, you know, you, you communicate to people on, on Discord. Well, that's how I do it. Like all my clients yeah, and same here. You know. Yeah. Like it, it's an essential on your laptops. Right. Or so I guess it's like, how do you limit that? It's such like a powerful. Yeah. There's, there's, there's two, there's tooling for it, man. If you go look at the, it's like a, whatever they call it, like the digital health limits or whatever you can, you can set up per <laughs> app limits and per focus mode limits but of course like if the habit's strong enough i'll often find myself being like okay ignore limit let me go check discord uh but that's like a checkpoint for you to have with yourself like am i really ignoring my time limit that i've set for yeah, myself yeah. For, for spending oh, yeah, time for sure. in this thing and do i really need to be doing that right now yeah for sure you have to really like break the habits on the yeah. um i mean one thing that i i haven't had time to do that i that i definitely like to do um, mm -hmm. and I probably will have time after Valorum releases is go in the woods for a couple of days, uh, and just camp out and not do any of it. Right. But that's hard oh, to yeah. do when you're going into a, a release. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine just like you, you had some bug out of all, all of the testing, all these betas and you launch such as some bug and you're in the middle of the woods. Oh man. <laughs> I guess, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah what, what would be the plan after you even had a bug? Because I, I know some people that have had um, like vulnerabilities unexpectedly, obviously, but they don't have like any incident kind of plan. So I, I guess, how do you plan for this stuff? Because it's, it's a common, I, I wouldn't say common, but it's a very possible thing that can happen in DeFi when building a protocol. So how, how do you go sure. about that? Well, it, it, it's, it's a hard thing to solve because, you know, I've been building infrastructure and in finance for more than 10 years and software for more than 16 and building high availability systems, right? 30 petabyte mm -hmm. storage clusters that stand behind some of the most important financial infrastructure in the world where downtime was measured in the millions of dollars lost uh, per hour. Oh, wow. And so I've, 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 I've thought about these problems before, but yeah. the thing that you have, you know, in traditional finance and, and banks and stuff is that you can patch the code and you can upgrade it. And yeah. you also don't have all your code in the open source for people to look at. So I'm pretty sure every bank on the planet, if their code was open source today, would, would just get hacked uh, and wrecked immediately. So it, <laughs> it's a much harder problem space when your code is open source. And particularly with the philosophy we've taken at Valorum, where it's a piece of immutable uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Right? Um, we're working on pre-mortems and 
you know, obviously if anything happened, we would hold a postmortem, but having this idea of incident response, um, we've thought a lot about monitoring events that are coming off the smart contracts for, you know, suspicious mm -hmm. things that may be happening and, and getting out ahead of them and being able to communicate that to the community. We're using some interesting tooling that, that comes from, you know, our web two experience, like uh, Datadog and post hog. So data dog for aggregating traces. So we can basically see like front end to back end to smart contract and back out again, oh, yeah. the trace yeah. of a single user interaction. And then we can build patterns out of those traces and, and be aware mm -hmm. of suspicious events that are going on. But what we can't do is update the smart contracts, right? Because mm -hmm. then it can't be used as a, as, as a money Lego. So you, you kind of have to make a choice. Do you want upgradable smart contracts that that gives the dev team the ability to rug people? Or do you want immutable smart contracts? that gives doesn't give the dev team the ability to hotfix a uh, you know a bug um, mm. I, I think we we went on the side of immutability because we want these things to be rock solid and that's why we had to put I would say more time into testing than we did into development to flush out all possible bugs. Yeah, so yeah. you do everything humanly possible to, to almost you know get to a level of formal verification uh, yeah. maybe even do that we, we didn't do that but we might for a future version um, and that you do what you can it's, you know, or you're building an upgradable thing. And I personally am not a fan of upgradable smart contracts. I don't know how you mm -hmm. feel about that, but. Yeah, Sam, I, I think it kind of goes against the the kind of blockchain way, immutability. Yeah. But, you know, adding to that, like we do have a good DevOps workflow, right? We have CI, we have Slither running, we have yeah. Forge tests, we have the unit tests. So if we did need to push out a new version and we have the close partnership with an auditor, if we needed an emergency to push out a new version for people to migrate to uh, of Clear, we could do that in relatively short order. And the other thing about Clear is that options by their nature, not being perpetuals are ephemeral. So if there were to mm -hmm. be some sort of vulnerability, uh, the capital would roll over pretty quickly to a new version. And that's how we plan to be able to do like minor point releases, right? Is that that's if true. people are writing dailies or weeklies or monthlies, that the capital will come out of the system in, in mm -hmm. some amount of time anyway. Yeah. I want to kind of like, okay, so I guess also having like all these tools for security, you know, like Slower, Echidna, whatever. Do you think there's anything lacking right now that would that would basically help you a ton or something that you wish existed uh, for, I guess, protocol development? I mean, if you asked me that question two years ago, I would have said yes. But right now, I'm very happy with the state of tooling. It's mm -hmm. more like a language thing that I'm thinking these days is not right. quite like where I'd compiler. like to be. Like Not even the compiler, but like traits, generics, right. lifetimes. Yeah. dynamic memory yeah. allocation, like some of the stuff we got into with the, the discrete random variant generator, right, where I'm like going down into Yule and doing uh, a dynamic memory queue and having to hand yeah. implement any sort of dynamic memory objects or when I want to go generic across an operation, the, the type of stuff you can do in Rust, yeah. for example, that you can't do in Solidity. My personal dream world would be where somebody built a language, a high level language with Rust like semantics on top of Huff. Right. So so that's oh, yeah. where I'm seeing more need in the <laughs> ecosystem is in a language like whether it be Solidity One, Solidity Two, or some other language that comes along that provides better semantics for trace generics and lifetimes in dynamically dynamically allocated memory primarily. Um, that's still gas efficient and lets you get into polymorphism in a better way. And yeah, mm -hmm. those those sorts of things. I mean, but Forge Foundry you know, Slither, they provide a pretty solid stack. I mean, what do you think? What are, what are you looking for these days in additional tooling and languages? I mean, my days of uh, of smart contract development are kind of over. I'm more in like the tooling space now, but I think what lacks is probably depth in tooling. So I think all the tools right now are very surface level. Um, they don't think about game theory um, where you're incorporating, you know, external contracts, different contexts, uh, multi-transaction setups, all this kind of stuff. Um, kind of what a black hat would think of so i mean I, that's hard to do in terms of tooling right like it is, i'm yeah. just thinking about other things that we did you know in the enterprise and web 2 like i don't know if you heard of chaos monkey right but like running cloud systems we would build what we called chaos monkeys that would just go in and be disruptive on purpose uh, mm -hmm. So you could kind of look at that as like a malicious actor in a, in a foundry invariant test, right? So yeah. instead of an actor, it does something good. It's an actor who does crazy things uh, to try <laughs> and break the system all the time. And you can write yeah. those 
right now, but but that's something I think that's going to come down to, you know, a, a a security researcher or very you know security minded smart contract developer writing those actors custom uh, per system and looking at the, the integration thing. Um, it's an interesting space, but I'm not sure how you automate it quite thinking about it. Yeah, now. yeah, it, it's quite difficult. Um, but even I think maybe like invariant generation, like maybe automated testing generation, I think that would be quite interesting, although also quite challenging to achieve. But I'm just very interested in like the hard things. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, oh, yeah. And and I mean, these these are the things that like ultimately increase the security of the space, make yeah. it more legitimate, make it more possible to have increased development velocity, velocity, because it's very hard still to write and, you know, verify smart contracts that are going to yeah. hold tokens. And like, I mean, you know, it's scary thinking, Hey, what if I write this thing? And it's, it's, it's scary and exciting. What if I write this thing and it holds a billion dollars of value eventually? <laughs> Yeah. Am, am I good enough to think ahead of all the things that could happen here? Probably yeah, exactly. not, right? Like, and if you believe you are, it's probably hubris. And like, mm -hmm. I, I find myself really like double, triple, quadruple guessing <laughs> <laughs> as I'm doing this. Yeah, like, have I, have I missed anything? Like better check yeah, again. Yeah. Yeah, so more tooling like that would certainly be awesome. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think one final question just to help all the people wanting to do startups. What do you think are like, were the hardest things that you went through and how would you go about overcoming them in a better sense if you were to start, you know, a new startup? Well, it's, it, it's still early, right. For me, like right. we're, we're launching in a couple of weeks. So I, you know, I don't think I know all the things to really answer that fully yet, but for the real early days, you know, during a bear market, like approaching VCs who are down bad, right. And not getting funding. <laughs> Uh, and sticking with your project is one thing I think that, yeah. that I did. And I would recommend to other people who think they have a good idea, like stick with your idea, even if you don't get don't just right jump ship. Yeah, bootstrap it, man, like figure out how to bootstrap it. What I could have done better, you know, I did have significant churn in the people who came in and out of the project initially, because I didn't really have a formalized hiring process, kind of like you're interested, come work on this thing. Maybe yeah. there is some value in, in bringing some of that, like, you know, formalized hiring process in, even though it does kind of add some of the gatekeeping, but like early days, you got to, you got to do checks on people if they're yeah. uh, not only interested, but also like highly competent. And, and so there's two ways to do that, right? There's like a formal interview process and then there's like, bring them in for a month or two and, and see if they perform well. I could have done a little bit better there in reducing the churn of people who came in and out of the project, which was probably, like I said, about 50%. Um, and then the other thing that I think is, uh, never announce a release date until you are released say now next later instead of we're releasing next month uh because otherwise you can inchworm along because some of these projects are big and take a long time and you can burn social yeah. capital by like inchworming on your release date quite a bit which which we definitely did at valorum so uh, mm -hmm. if you look at the website now you'll see now next later on the roadmap not like uh, <laughs> you know q1 q2 q3 uh because we don't know how long it's going to take to get things done until they're done yeah so that sure. would be the other piece yeah. There's always like um, road bumps and unexpected, I guess, challenges that take up a lot of time. Yep. And I think it's just like a nature of development as well. You don't know what's going to happen from, you know, it's like a chain reaction. You, you don't know what's going to happen from, uh, you know, changing something or you made a found of like a critical bug. You have to change the whole architecture. It takes like an extra week or, you know. Or, or like you that. try to build a uh, discrete probability mass function generator for two months, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The fun um, stuff. Um, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, those, those, are, those are the other things. And, and I think, you know, it's an, it's an exciting space, man. I think we have so much left to build. I think a lot of it is, oh, is yeah, so, so early, immature, yeah. so immature still like, yeah, we are, we are still really early. And yeah, I guess that that's all I've got. I mean, ideas are cheap and execution is everything, right? Yeah. Um, so you got to get out there and execute. Uh, as well yeah yeah for sure maybe just one extra question how do you execute efficiently there you go because that's the whole core of startups right it's just execution so what we've been doing and what's been a huge tool for us lately has been has been using linear for you know software development and breaking stuff down uh so basically like product you know goes and talks to users and understands mm -hmm. their the opportunities 
you know, and all that kind of stuff and the pain points for the users. And then we come together and design solutions and we go and we build them a uh, very single piece flow kind of Kanban, maybe a little bit of scrum light style where like we get a thing and we flow it through all the way to the end. And one person is working on one thing from start to finish ideally. Right. And of course we yeah. have to move around a lot, but running like a weekly cadence on that readjustment. So giving people a week to focus on a problem before we like yank the priorities and shift them when we need to respond yeah. to new learnings. That's been working great for us. Our velocity is, you know, increasing. And and also the other thing I would say that's been useful being a distributed team, uh, and maybe a little contrary in here is that we use metaverse co-working when we're doing more complex designs. So we'll use Discord voice for like quick calls or just mm -hmm. like hacking on something in the IDE. But if we're going to go design an algorithm or we're going to go design new UI screens or we're going to talk about something complicated, uh, we actually pop on VR headsets and get in a co-working space together because wow. we can bring in our computers and AR we can make eye contact, we can use hand signals, we can draw on a whiteboard together, and it's immersive. And so yeah. like, if I'm talking to you right now, you know, over audio here, I don't know if you're on your phone, I'm not saying you are, but like, I don't know that. So <laughs> things may get lost in translation. But when yeah. you work in the metaverse, you can see that like, oh, that devs on his computer right now typing something and I'm talking about something else, let me pause and get his attention before I like plow over mm -hmm. uh, with this concept and he doesn't get it. Yeah, for sure. I've never really, that's kind of the first I've ever heard of that. But it does sound like quite interesting. I guess everybody would need a headset though, which I, I assume you provide. Yep, yep. We got them for everybody. And I think it was a, it was a great investment because like, hey, I mean, sometimes we're, we're trying to work on something for three or four hours, right? Yeah. That can be brutal in a, in a voice call. Like the bandwidth oh, yeah. is just too low. The, the medium is too flat. So like those ways of working uh, and, and the mediums we use for communication, it's that or you fly somewhere in person and just go hack in a room sometimes, right? Like yeah, that's, yeah, for sure. But, but the headsets are cheaper, frankly, than that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, definitely early adopters of, of the metaverse for work, uh, but it's been going well for us. And I would say it was a worthwhile investment for the company. You know, the, the headsets are like 500 bucks each. And what is that really mm -hmm. for dev tooling at the end of the day? Yeah, for sure. Make it all back anyway. Yeah, it sounds like a I think I need to try that. <laughs> sounds like a good time, actually. Well, you can come co-work co -work with us in the metaverse if you want, man. You're welcome to come come visit with us at the uh, Valora Metaverse <laughs> offices sometime. <laughs> yeah, I'll come I'll come pop over, over, do an actual interview in the metaverse once the launch happens and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, man, it's been such a great, great time talking to you. I, I've learned a lot, especially about options and your platform and kind of what the space is needing at, at the moment. I think it's definitely going to be a big thing and hopefully launch goes well. Um, yeah, hopefully it was good for you as well. But yeah, it's been such a pleasure. Yeah, it's been it's been great on my side as well. And uh, hopefully talk again soon. And yeah, great job with your new podcast. Definitely been hearing <laughs> a lot of cool guests come on and I'm very psyched to have been one of them. So yeah. Yeah, you're one of the cool guests now. You've made the list. <laughs> but for anyone else that wants to get someone on the podcast, just uh, DM at scraping bits on twitter or send an email to scraping bits at gmail.com and i'll review it and hopefully get them on otherwise thank you so much for coming on al and i'll see everyone in the next episode